Happy Good Friday to everyone. Welcome. Again, my name is John. I'm a uh, pastor here at the church. And this Good Friday is really meant, for those of you that haven't been to a Good Friday service before, uh, it's meant to be a little more somber, a little more focused on the cross. And the idea is the anticipation builds the Easter for the empty tomb. So it's intentionally a little less focused on the resurrection, which is something we never do. But Good Friday, that is actually what you do. So if you're wondering, that is uh, the purpose. Let's pray. God, you are, you are good, you are kind, you are merciful, you are just, you are holy. Thank you for everyone that is gathered here today. I pray that the, uh, the gospel is clear, that the Bible is clear, and that you would remove any sort of um, mental distraction from us, any, any sort of focus on worries or things that would distract us from focusing on the truth of who you are, and that you would continue to be glorified through the preaching. Amen. Okay. I want you guys to take a moment. And imagine the most perfect place you've ever been. Now, half of Ohio right now is in what state? Florida. That is correct. Everyone is in Florida. What is the most perfect place you've ever been? Picture perfect. Some people might say Hawaii. Some people might say Fiji. Some people may, might say Cabo. Did anyone here say downtown Toledo? Why are you guys laughing at that? Yes, nobody said that. But when we picture perfect, I bet few of you pictured Monowee, Nebraska. Now, if I'm saying that wrong, I'm sorry. Never heard of it? Me either. Why is this, according to this article, the greatest small town in America? I'll tell you why. It is the smallest incorporated municipality in the entire United States. There's no one, nowhere quite like it. It's a minuscule Nebraska town, and it has slowly been abandoned by all but two of its residents, Elsie and Rudy Eiler. I bet they're fun. When Rudy passed away in 04, Elsie became Monoe's sole resident, mayor, librarian, and bartender. People love to stop by the tavern to chat with Elsie and learn about the town's history, population one. Elsie files and pays taxes to herself and also grants her own license for the bar. Yes, we know why it's popular. She pays her own taxes. Best job. Picture the perfect job. Now, for you engineers, I told Paul I was going to do this. I gave a handout, and I intentionally left one of the dashes off of one of the fill-ins to mess with the accountants and engineers. What is the perfect job? Picture perfect. They had asked me this in college. You know what I said? I want to be a philanthropist. Think about it. The perfect job. Steve Martin, sage, wise man, said all I ever wanted was an honest week's pay for an honest day's work. He was kidding, of course. He's a comedian for the kids. But I want us to picture perfect. Think about what perfection looks like. And today's text is Luke 23, and we'll be covering a lot. So it's going to be brief, 33 through 55. So if you have your Bible, turn in your Bible there to Luke 23, 33 through 55. Picture perfect. Today's text is kind of like a diamond. You're going to see a lot of obscure angles and vantage points and conversations, people wondering what's going on. To the farmer, in a drought, rain is picture perfect. To the man adrift at sea, land is picture perfect. To the person pinned down by smoke in a fire, the fireman is picture perfect. And to fallen humanity and redeemed rebels, the crucified king of kings, lifted high, beaten, bloody, and shamed, is picture perfect. So we'll be reading our text as we go. 
This is what's known as a public service announcement. For kids, this was the precursor to email, just covering our bases here. But we don't have time to read it all up front. When you think about today, many of you think of a place called Calvary. In fact, didn't we sing the old rugged cross? Isn't it Calvary in there? And it's Golgotha in uh, Aramaic. But Luke is gent uh, Gentile, so he's using primarily Greek terms. But this is the focal point of redemptive history. If you think about it, I had to clip this. But you think about the Old Testament. It's roughly 75% of the entire Bible, spanning about 4,000 years back into before time began. This chunk we call the New Testament, how many years was it written down? Conservative answers only, please. Okay, we'll say about 75, okay? I'm not, don't hold me to that, but I'm going to say 75. 25% of the Bible written in 75 years. Think of the New Testament as the exclamation point of the Bible. But within the Bible, there's another exclamation point, and it's the cross. In fact, we call this week the Passion Week. You guys have heard this, the Passion Week or Holy Week, whatever you want to refer to it as. Much of the gospel's material is dedicated to this week. So within the exclamation point, which is the New Testament, is this week. And then within that, all of redemptive history, like a laser, is pointing to right here, to this hill, to this place. So when we consider that, we want to set the stage for what are we looking at here? Well, it's dusty. It's gruesome. There's agony. There's mocking. There's torture. There's laughing. There's pointing. It's a spectacle. It's really a, an absolute disaster. Human arrogance, the height of human depravity, God's perfect lamb is slain before the foundation of the world, lifted up in glory, demonstrating humble love against that backdrop. So picture perfect. And if you're taking notes or keeping score, there are four points, and they all start with I. Now, the point of this is just to help you remember what we're talking about here. First, we're going to see the irony. Second, we're going to see, and this is where I got the accountants and CPAs and all of you, the identity. Third, the indecency. And fourth, the insurmountable love of the triune God. So we have irony, identity, indecency, and insurmountable love. Irony can be good. Sarcasm is usually bad. There's a fine line between the two. Verses 33 through 34. And when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right, one on his left. And Jesus said, for God, for, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, and they cast lots to divide his garments. In these two verses, we're seeing a lot happen. Uh, we're seeing the location of this place called the skull because it looked and still looks like a skull, you can go there and likely see, now it's not 100%, but you can likely see the spot where they think he was crucified. There's two, two main places where they think he was crucified. We see he's between criminals. How is Jesus being treated at this time in history? As a criminal, right? Between two criminals. And if you back up just a little further, who went free instead of Jesus? Barabbas. Barabbas was a good guy. He was a, a nice, a humble guy. <laughs> just look at me like, no. He was a murderer. Some of the gospel says he was a thief, but he was a murderer. We know that. The murderer goes free. The lamb goes to the cross. And if you're a student of history, you know Genesis 22. This is a picture of the gospel. So we see the irony of the cross here. And there's a little bit of debate just so we know that whether or not Jesus literally said, Father, forgive them, they, maybe this was added later, it doesn't matter because we know why he was there to forgive his people. He preached, repent, and believe to be forgiven. So we know this is consistent with his message. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Casting lots was a way to determine who would get his clothes. This was the fulfillment of a prophecy. So that seems insignificant until you recognize there's no way that a human could arrange for people to gamble for a thief's clothes. And the Bible makes a point that it was seamless. So they're 
we're seeing the irony here. We have the perfect Lamb of God in the most ironic of places because of God's sovereign plan. Now, we have to understand irony, okay? Irony describes situations that are strange or sometimes funny because they happen in a way that we wouldn't expect. It seems to be the opposite of what you expect, okay? That's ironic, okay? So you ever see somebody uh, that's, let's say they're, they're, they're very, very uh, short, and they say, hey, Big Jim, that's irony, okay? Now, when we see Jesus here on the cross, it's ironic because the judge of all the earth is on trial and convicted, though he was innocent and he had done nothing wrong. Wrongly condemned, but freely condemned by his own will. And we know that Jesus is there of his own will because he said, no one takes my life from me, right? I lay it down freely and I will take it up again. So we see irony on full display. But it's nothing new for humanity to reject God, is it? Remember when we went through Samuel? They wanted a king. God said to Samuel, they haven't rejected you, Samuel. They've rejected me. In the garden, in Genesis 3, we see humanity rejecting God and choosing themselves and Satan's team. Treason. From the beginning of time, humanity has been at war with God. There's no neutral towards God, for or against, gather or scatter. God's not confused about the teams. Our treason is visible in every vestige and vestibule, forgetting Adam Forgetting to love our neighbor with all our hearts, mind, soul, and strength because of our radical corruption. Every part of us is affected by sin. Sin can't be quantified, and it can't be paid back unless you're infinite, which is a big problem for us. It's who we are. We're born rebels. We inherit that nature from the man of dust, from Adam. Genesis 3, 3. God said... You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. You shall not touch it. Take it. We see the people rejecting God with Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, obey the voice of the people and all that they say. They have not rejected you. They've rejected who? Me from being king. They had the king of the universe and they wanted tall Saul. And now they have the nobody from Nazareth and they reject him too. Wrong choices at every turn here. John 19, 15, they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to him, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests, the religious of the religious, we have no king but Caesar. Wasn't that nice? Convenient? Isaiah's prophecy being fulfilled, he poured out his soul to death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sins of many. Irony on full display. If you've never seen it at the cross, people made of dust condemning the one that was sinless, the only good person to ever live, Jesus of Nazareth. But there was more to Jesus than met the eye. So a couple of questions. Are you perfect? When you picture perfect, please don't raise your hand. (laughs) The kids call that a cell phone. Don't raise your hand. But when you picture perfect, are you perfect? And you know the question that no one in our culture wants to ask, by what standard, right? Nobody cares. You just make it up. Well, the only standard that matters is God's standard. And he says you have to be perfect in thought, word, and deed. So that leaves me out. Have you kept the law? Maybe you're religious. Maybe you're really trying. I mean, your feet are moving 100 miles an hour, doing all the good you can to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. Name that guy, anyone know? Jonathan Wesley. He was trying. He was lost as can be. Now, he did get saved. But you can't climb to God. I believe it was Spurgeon said, trying to get through God, to God through your own works is like trying to climb a rope of sand. Can't do it. When you picture perfect, do you see a tattered, bloody carpenter gasping in the sun? Here's a question for you. Do you see a stranger on the cross? Do you recognize him as he looks into your eyes? Imagine you were his neighbor. 
Imagine he helped you install a door. Maybe he helped you make a table. He came to your birthday. He knew you. He always had a kind word for you. Do you love him? Do you remember that that's not really a stretch? Because he made you. He knows you. He created every molecule. No accidents. It's true. So we have to determine just who is this Jesus of Nazareth. In the Gospel of John, you have this dialogue between Philip and Nathaniel, and can anything good come out of Nazareth? And he says, come and see. He says, before he called you, I saw you under the fig tree. He says, you are the Messiah. He says, you believe because I said, I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than this. You'll see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. The end of John 1. Who is Jesus? Nobody knows what's going on. Nobody knows who he is. The identity of Jesus Verses 35 through 43, the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he's the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. Now, this was hotly contested. The Jews wanted it changed to, he said he was. Pilate says, it's staying as written. Again, ironic. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, Are you not the Christ? Save us. Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, Do you not fear God since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? We indeed justly, we're receiving a due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Innocence of Jesus again right there. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. A couple of points here. Who is Jesus? How can a man from Nazareth help anyone at all? He's got bad news. If he's not truly God, he can't help anyone because he had a sin nature. And he can't pay an infinite debt, so we're in big trouble. But there's no one like Jesus. He's unique. The Bible uses the Greek word monogenes. It's begotten. First in rank or order. Jesus is unique. He's not like other people. I'll explain how we can know that in just a second. But notice the reactions. They're standing by. Everybody wants to stand by. You see these crimes happening today, things like that. People are standing there. They're filming. You're like, why are you filming? Shouldn't you help that person? Well, there's Jesus, the king of the universe, on the cross. They're standing there. Others are having a good time. They're, they're mocking him. Having a good old time. King of the Jews above his head, the irony that the king of kings, who was the king of the Jews, who is the king of all creation, on the cross. Criminals are giving him a hard time. And don't be too easy on this guy that gets saved, because he started off on the other side. He was ridiculing Jesus too, but he had a change of what? Heart. Call that repentance. And he says, do you not fear God? Fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The fools despise wisdom and knowledge. Fear of God. They were condemned rightly, and he recognized that. Jesus was condemned for us. He was condemned in our place. He was our substitute. He wasn't there for no purpose, but he wasn't there because he'd sinned. Sin had no claim on Jesus. And he says, today you will be with me in paradise, in your kingdom. Well, the thief on the cross knew Jesus had a kingdom, right? If the earth was all there was, uh, this is not much of a king here, because he's dying. So he knew there was another place, another king. Maybe he understood. Clearly, it sounds like he does, because Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, don't go down too many rabbit trails here, okay? Where were they? Jesus went straight to heaven, okay? We call that paradise. It wasn't another place. This was uh, where he was immediately after death, absent from the body at home with the Lord, okay? He was immediately in heaven. The atonement was finished on the cross. That's very important. You understand that. So the human nature of Jesus dies. There's a divine mystery here, which Ephesians uses the term mystery more than almost any book in the Bible. You have this unique God-man. And the Nicene Creed said it this way. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, only begotten, that is of the substance of the Father, God of God, light of light, true God of true God. They're being very clear here. Begotten, not made. Not made. Of one substance with the Father, through whom all things were made. See, the early church has had this down from the beginning because you've had... People like the Jehovah's Witnesses, Arians at this time, 
different cults trying to convince you that Jesus isn't who he said he was. Well, just who did Jesus say he was? Well, you can tell who someone is by their words, their actions, and their titles. Three ways to identify who someone is. You can tell by their words, their actions, and their titles. And we know that the human nature of Jesus died, but the divine nature can't die. For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Since therefore the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Now the atonement was paid to God the Father, not Satan. Very important. However, death is the devil's weapon. Lies cause death. Sin leads to death. That's his weapon. The power of death, lies, sin leads to death. Always. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. That's Hebrews 2.17. You guys can look those verses up later. They're also on the back of your sheet. He's truly God. Now, if he were just a nice, confused, religious fuddy dud, that can't help us either. A lot of zealous people died for stupid things over the years. You need a perfect, infinite sacrifice. Only an infinite God can pay an infinite debt. In Mark 2, Matthew 6, which we covered, I don't know how many weeks ago that was, but you have the guy coming through the ceiling. He reads their minds and says, so that you know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, I say to you, take up your mat and walk. They said they were accusing Jesus of blasphemy. Same charge he ended up on the cross for, by the way. And so he demonstrated he had the authority to forgive sins, but only God can forgive sins. So that is an action that Jesus takes to demonstrate through his words that he is God. He also says, I am. He uses the covenant name of God, Yahweh. So we see that in John 8. Daniel 7, his favorite title for himself was Son of Man, title of deity. And the irony of this, he's standing before the Jewish people, and they say, do you say nothing? Tell us plainly, are you the Christ? And he said, from now on, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with glory. And they tore their robes, and they said, blasphemy. Don't let anyone ever tell you Jesus never claimed to be God. He was crucified for blasphemy. Jewish people understood what he was saying, and he knew what he was saying. And he wanted to go to the cross. It was the plan. How he got to the cross was claiming to be God. He said, my father's always working, I'm working. Who is always working? God the Father. They said he couldn't eat grain on the Sabbath. He couldn't heal people on the Sabbath. Well, God's upholding the universe even on the Sabbath. So he's forgiving sins, he's forgiving thieves, he's raising the dead. John 11 raises Lazarus, raises the widow's son. Forgiving people, commissioning people. And he also receives worship. So his words, actions, and titles demonstrate his deity, his power, and his authority as truly human and truly God. You need both. Colossians 2.9, this is a tough one to get around. In him the fullness of deity dwells bodily? Huh. Jesus is truly God. Most people don't deny the humanity of Jesus at this point in history. They have a big problem with the God Jesus, though. God is a trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-eternal, three persons, one being. Jesus is equal with the Father in Godness, but they have different roles. And then we see the most honest conversation perhaps in history. This is called beating the buzzer. One of the criminals hanged says, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Again, verse 40. The other rebuked him saying, do not fear God since you're under the same sentence of condemnation. The people ridiculing God were about to stand before the God they were ridiculing and he was going to throw them into hell. By the way, while this is happening, Jesus is enduring the hell of judgment that we deserve. The wrath of God. You see, it wasn't just that Jesus was tortured on a cross. Lots of people died on crosses. It was that he was enduring the wrath of God in some mysterious way. A separation within the trinity of some sort. Enduring the hell we deserve. Every last sin for believers. For all time. Past, present, and future. Question. Are you ready to stand before Jesus? Most people, no offense to vacation, we started with vacation, we're going back to vacation. Most people spend more time thinking about where they're going on a trip than where they'll spend eternity. Kind of maddening. Eternity goes forever. Our life here is a mist, which we went through James, the vapor. Matthew 7, we cover that too. Don't be anxious. You picture perfect in this unique Truly human, truly God-man. The nobody from Nazareth. Jesus, and that's not me being aggressive towards Jesus. said there was nothing about his appearance that we should celebrate. He was probably short. He probably wasn't good looking. He, you know, that's the humility of God. He wasn't trying to impress people. People look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. Cardio. 
He's unique. So the identity of Jesus. So we've seen the irony of the cross. We've seen the identity of Jesus, truly human, truly God. But the indecency of death. We don't like to think about death. Verses 44 through 49. It was about the sixth hour. There was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. While the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, Jesus calling out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw that this had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. Again, innocent. All the crowds that assembled for the spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. So look here, darkness over the whole land. Does this sound familiar? What do we think of here? Let my people go. That's the exodus. You know what else it is? It's happening on April 8th. Is that the right date? We're literally going to be in darkness. God blocked out the sun when he was leading the people out of Egypt. He blocked out the sun when he was dying on the cross for that region of the, the earth. So the sun goes dark. This curtain is torn in two. Now, the significance of this briefly, the Holy of Holies was separated by a curtain. The curtain represented, we're unclean, can't go into God. You need some sort of covering, pointing forward in faith in the Messiah. Read the book of Hebrews if you really want to understand the Old Testament. It's the best book for that, my opinion. Because you have the sacrificial picture over and over. It says if the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin, why did they keep going? They would have ceased. But Jesus, after making purifications for sin, sat down and is seated at the majesty of the right hand of God. Once for all, to tell us die, paid in full, it is finished. So the sun's light fails, the temple's torn in two, and Matthew, dead people come out of tombs. This is not a normal guy. This is not a nobody. This is a somebody. This is the one somebody. Dead people come out of tombs in Matthew's gospel, but here the curtain's torn from top to bottom, signifying that the wall of separation between humanity and God is removed, which means you have direct access to God through faith, trust, and your prayers are effective and powerful because of Jesus. All of that is unique to you as a believer at this point in history. So that's torn. This guy says, he's innocent. What well, is our second, third? If we're keeping score again, we have Pilate. Actually, we have Pilate's wife. Have nothing to do with this just man. I have suffered greatly in a dream because of him. Innocent. Herod. I don't, Herod's nuts. I don't see anything wrong with him. Then you have Pilate. Do you want me to release to you Jesus? No, we want Barabbas. Innocent, I wash my hands of him. And then we have the thief on the cross, the guy literally being crucified. Innocent. And now we have a Roman centurion who would be a high-ranking officer. He says he's innocent. It seems like a lot of people want you to know that Jesus was innocent because he was sinless. You can't pay for the sin debt of humanity for your sheep, if you have a sin debt yourself, you would be an unworthy what? Sacrifice. Take a lamb without blemish. Passover picture happening here. Innocent. The crowds, they're watching the spectacle. Hey, let's get some popcorn. They saw what had taken place, and they returned home sorrowful. They knew something bad just happened. It wasn't right. All his acquaintances and women who had followed him from Galilee, they were right there, right next to him, front and center. It's not what it says. They were at a distance watching. I don't blame them. Who knows? It was a scary time. Peter tried to cut a guy's head off. Things were going bad. But they're at a distance. Are you watching Jesus from a distance? Are you an interested observer in this nobody from Nazareth? Or is he somebody so we see, reminiscent of the Exodus clip coming up, eclipse coming up here, and in Toledo, the last one, 1806. The next one's 2099, so this is it. But the humiliation of the grave, the humiliation of death, the indecency of death. We dress up death, right? We say, oh yeah, they went peacefully. It was real, real nice, real... They were just so happy. As believers, I believe that's true. But most people don't die that way. It's not good. Death is a humiliation. Life for Jesus was a humiliation too. He endured the shame of the cross. Right? Humiliation. 
And there's a weird sense in which the cross was the humiliation of Christ and the glorifying of Christ. It was both on full display. But the grave is a sad place. And there was a promise made in Psalm 16, you will not abandon my soul to the grave or to hell or let your Holy One see corruption. And they're gloating, they're around him. It's prophesied this is going to happen. The curse of death, the crown of thorns from Genesis 3.3 3 on his head. Genesis 22, Abraham sacrifices a lamb who's caught in, ram who's caught in the thicket. We see this curse being reversed at the cross. The seriousness of sin. Ezekiel 18.4, behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Death comes to all people because all have sinned. Sin is horrendous. Death is humiliating. See somebody get old and waste away? Made in the image of God? Representing God? This is your God? Your God? You're wasting away? Murder? Disease? Bloodshed? Now, you can look at this two ways, the right way or the wrong way. What kind of God would allow that? Many a people wag their fingers at God because of our sinful nature. The other way to look at it is, whoa, something went real, really wrong here. I better figure out what's going on. This ship is sinking. The earth, spoiler alert, it's going down. It will be burnt up and remade. It's not good. It's suffering from the effects of the curse. Sin is serious. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, 1 Corinthians 15, 26. Question, if God did not pardon Jesus who is sinless, what possibility is there for you to stand before God and say, look at me, look how good I've done. I'm so nice. I'm so kind. I went to so many sermons. God is not impressed. God is impressed with one person, himself. God is impressed with Jesus. Lastly, a little bit of good news. The real good news will be on Easter. The insurmountable love of the triune God for you is sheep. Verses 50 through 55. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man. He had not consented to their decision and action. He was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate, asked for the body of Jesus, took it down, wrapped it in a linen shroud, laid it in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The women come with him from Galilee, followed, and saw the tomb where his body was laid. They returned, prepared spices and ointments, verse 56. What happens next? Are you still picturing perfect? Does this look like the perfect plan? Is this the perfect day? Is this the perfect three hours plus in history? Is this really what it all boils down to? Some zealous Nazarene crucified on a hill and thrown in a rich man's tomb. Boy, that would be a sad ending, wouldn't it? If Christ is not risen, you are still in your sins, and we are of all people most to be pitied. Because it means you're doomed. How much faith are we putting in that empty tomb? right answer is all of it all of it you may be wondering will jesus rise there used to be a time kids where you'd have to wait to see the next thing and they would do these awful things called to be continued this sermon's a to be continued will he rise i don't know i don't know god knows people should have known jesus repeatedly in the gospel says The Son of Man will be delivered over, crucified, and on the third day he will rise. He tells them over and over, but they didn't understand it. They had Psalm 16, you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, your Holy One see corruption. Will he come back? Is he coming back? All things continue as they have from the beginning of time. 
the battle cry of the uniformitarian, the atheist. Where is this God you talk about? Where is this Jesus of Nazareth? You silly Christian with your crutch. Wow, is it a crutch? Will he come back? He's still in the tomb. Not looking good for us. Will he give you another day? I'm young. Look, i got my whole life ahead of me. That's true. We all have our whole life ahead of us. Youth is no guarantee of old age. Did you know that? Now, don't argue mortality tables with an insurance adjuster, but the point is, just because you're young doesn't mean you're going to be old. Life is a mist. Here's the most important question. Will he let me in? Jesus, we did this thing, and we did that thing. I went over here. I, I did evangelism everywhere. Didn't you know? I taught the Chinese. I did this thing and that thing. That's not directed at Kerwin. That's directed at me. I teach the Chinese kids. Uh, God's not impressed with that. Those are good things. We should do those things. God is impressed with one person. It was this guy from Jamaica, and he would sing, How I Love That Man from Galilee. And he sang it in a way that you believed him, is the thing. Like, probably everyone in Jamaica knows this guy. But he rounds kids up and, and explains the gospel to him. And I, I met him, and he, so all he did was sing and smile. He's probably going to live to be 197. But he loved Jesus like he was real. Faith is a gift from God. It's not something you can try harder to do or have or be smart enough to go get. But it is available, okay? The offer of God's grace is universal. We're really clear here. The call to repent and believe in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of the God-man Jesus Christ is universal. It's offered to all people, freely, without charge. The debt has been paid on the cross. Jesus said it is finished. Because it is finished. Are you hoping in the cross? Are you hoping that that tomb is going to be empty on Sunday? You have to have both. You need the perfect life of Jesus. You need his death on the cross to pay your debt. And if you don't have an empty tomb, you don't have a savior. Because you have a guy that couldn't reverse the curse of death. The wage of sin is death. You have to beat death. The only way to beat death is to live a sinless life, die in the place, and rise. To save us. We could have just went to heaven. So think about over the next, uh, what day is this? The next day and a half, two days, whatever it is. They kept track differently in the Jewish calendar in the way three days was, was understood. And there's questions on, on how that's all calculated. But on Sunday morning, we will be celebrating a very empty tomb. So come back for that, because that is very encouraging. Let's pray. And then we have uh, one more song, buddy. Okay. But right, thank you for today. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your life. Thank you for